Thank you, Isabella. A design to print, D2P. Uh, me and my team are responsible for design to print. Uh, I am personally responsible for the people, the processes, and systems that we use to get design onto the substrate. So the graphic design to print to the store. Design to print. So I'd like to talk about crossing partner thinking and collaboration. First, I'd like to thank the sponsors for having me uh, at the conference. And I'd like to thank you for hanging in here with me, because uh, we are in the last day. So three, three key areas. OK. So there are three key areas I'd like to talk to you about. Why collaborate? Is your organization ready to collaborate? And after you determine and roll out a collaborative organization, how do you turn it into a culture of collaboration? So why collaborate? 61% of operations leaders believe cross-functional collaboration has the greatest potential for helping their company reach its strategic goals for operations and improve, improve on customer value. So I'd like to pull out customer value. And I know during the conference we've heard a lot about customer value, but as organizations and businesses and companies that sell products to customers, isn't it all about the customer value. Today's customers are looking for businesses to do more than just sell them a product. Your customers are actually asking for more value. They're asking questions like, is this product good for me? Is this product good for my family? Is this product easy to buy? So you have to offer your consumers and your customers more than just a product. So collaboration really is the new competition. It actually should be at the heart of your organization. Right now, what we're finding is uh, organizations are working in silos. And when, when people do that, when organizations work in, in, in silos, the, or, the people in the departments only really think of their own interests more so than company interests, and then even less consumer interests. So by building collaborative organizations, you're better able to compete. So why collaborate? Sharing of information for more effective execution. When departments work in silos, they tend to keep all of the information to themselves and only share it if it's relevant to whatever it is that the department is doing, as opposed to the goal of the company. What I found um, in Mondelez as we started working collaboratively once we separated from Kraft, when we were a part of Kraft Foods, we worked more so in silos. But four and a half years ago when they created Mondelez, we decided we'd be a collaborative culture. So what are just some of the things that we found once we started working collaboratively? Well, we found that there was a lot of duplication of efforts. So we found that a lot of the same work was being done in different departments because they weren't talking to one another. We also found that we had unnecessary work streams. So people were doing work that was not even necessary to the value of the products that we were putting out. One other thing we found, old timelines. So because we were now working collaboratively, we were finding that we were working to timelines that were decades old, that were no longer important. And last but not least, and most importantly, about sharing information, we found out that there was information that needed to be made available to
to the entire organization as opposed to just departmentally. So the second thing is you increase innovation because you have a cross-pollinization of ideas. So when you have departments working together, sharing information, then everyone gets a chance to give their ideas. So what does that do? That helps solve complex problems because you have a diversity of thought. You have everyone's mind in the game, so to speak. So everyone gets to participate in offering their ideas. Those are very, very good reasons to collaborate and build collaborative organizations. So next, let's talk about is your organization ready? I would say that it's very difficult to build a collaborative organization in a company that doesn't have it, but it's not impossible. Monolith made it a little easier in that we created the company with the collaborative culture. But it is possible to create this culture if you don't already have it. So, so these are some of the ways that I'd like you to look at to do that, to get your organization ready for a collaborative culture. First, you have to be clear about the destination. But it's the leadership of the company, and I apologize because I should have put that on the slide. The leadership of the company has to drive a collaborative organization. So the leadership of the company has to be clear about the destination. What's the destination? Delighted, delighted customers. Because remember, it's all about adding customer value. So that really is the destination. You want your customers to be huge fans. So next, you'll have to develop a mutual understanding. So once the leadership talks about how they want your, your consumers to just love your business and your brands, they have to make clear the short and long-term goals for that quarter, that year, that three-year, five-year plan. It's important that the leadership share and have mutual understanding of why you're going to move to this collaborative organization. Next is the sharing of information, but not so much across departments in this one. Getting your organization ready to be collaborative is all about encouraging the sharing of stories of what a good collaborative organization looks like, because there are businesses already doing it, so it's important that you start talking about it within your company and sharing stories of what good collaborative organizations look like. What do, they, what do they do? And what do they do well? Next, this is very important because nothing improves unless it's measured. If you want to build and sustain a collaborative organization, you have to be sure that there are measurements in performance reviews that speak to collaborative actions. So what are collaborative actions? Questions like, who have you assisted this year in another department? That's a performance measure. How many department projects or teams were you a part of? That's a collaborative organizational measurement. What best practices did you identify from working with another department? That's another great measurement that you can hold the organization and individuals accountable for. And last but not least, in getting your organization ready to be collaborative is what I call the technology imperative. The technology imperative is very important because we have so many different ways that we can connect. And in order to have a, a sustainable collaborative environment, you need to have a strategy and a plan for technology to enable your collaboration. There are many different options, computers, conference systems, 
mobile devices. It's very important that the leadership of the company ask the employees what type of technology that they like to use. It's important that employees are part of this conversation and are part of the enabling of the technology for the collaboration. In Mondelez, I actually, I, I work in Chicago in our corporate office, but every single person on every single team that I manage or that my managers manage works somewhere else in the world. So literally, I am seldom in the same room with, these, with the people I collaborate with. So at Mondelez, we have video conference systems. We use Microsoft Link for phone and voice and video conferencing calls. We use our mobile devices. We use our iPhones. Um, and of course, we use our computers. So it's very important that you have a technology plan and implementation strategy to help you with your collaborative environment. So next, so you have your plan, you know what technology you want to use. The next step is that you actually have to integrate it into the way people work. So it's one thing to have the plan and have the technology and roll it out, but you have to then make sure that people are actually going to use it. Because if done correctly, your technology and your technology strategy will actually help enable and make it easier for people to collaborate and communicate and share information and plan and execute projects and all of those things that make for great collaborative environments. So competition makes us faster, but collaboration makes us better. So next, let's talk about actually building the culture of collaboration. So the best and first way to do that is actually to create cross-functional teams. So creating cross-functional teams that support a company goal is one of the best ways to quickly implement a collaborative culture. At Mondelez, about three years ago, the company decided that they wanted to save a billion dollars. A billion dollars. So one of the ways that they decided that we would identify and find this billion dollars was they created a number of cross-functional teams. So I was, I was a member of one of those teams. So I was on a team of people that, so I was, I was on the team as the design to print representative. We had someone from packaging procurement. We had someone from packaging R&D. We had someone from legal. We had someone from regulatory. In, in total, it was about eight of us from, from all different parts of the world collaborating on a project that I'm proud to say is going to save one of these 50 million of that billion dollars. And it was due to this creation of this cross-functional team that we were able to identify that $50 million savings. But it was a project that was tied to the company goal. So the second thing, the second thing is to have clear communication standards and plans. So as part of this cross-functional team of people, remember I said there were eight departments in this cross-functional team? We actually decided, and it sounds kind of simple, having clear communication standards. It actually sounds a little simple, having clear communication standards and plans. But when you're working with people from all different departments, it's important that you actually have a plan for 
How often are we going to meet? How long are we going to meet? Have, have any of you ever been on a three-hour conference call? No, 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 they're not too good. Who actually is going to be in the meeting? Who gets to make decisions? Do we need to take notes? Do we need to put those notes anywhere so others can see them? So that kind of communication standard and plan needs to be in place as well when we create these cross-functional teams. The next thing is uh, setting schedules and sticking to them. And I know all of this seems simple, but it's very important to this collaborative culture that, that you're building. Um, so setting schedules and sticking to them. So I have conference calls at 4 a.m., 6 a.m., sometimes at 11 p.m. because I work with someone in Australia. So things like that are important that you set the schedule and that you actually stick to it. And everyone should be in agreement at the beginning of the forming of the team. So I know this, this incorporate individual performance measures uh, looks like it's a repeat. But in this case, I want to add that now that you're creating a culture of collaboration, you want to have a supportive environment and you also want to reward teamwork. So although you're going to ask the individual what team did you work on, what best practices did you identify, your organization is also going to reward the team and their teamwork. So the team I was on that identified this $50 million savings, they had a huge ceremony. We all got to walk on stage and you know get the applause. So and as a team, so it's very important that you do that in building this collaborative culture. Uh, we talked about the technology imperative, and it's important that you actually use it for the ease of communication. And then, again, and this is a repeat, sharing the stories of what good collabor collaboration looks like. But now that you've actually built your collaborative culture, you actually should have your own stories now that you can share. And what are ways, actually, that you can share them? At Mama Leagues, we share our collaborative stories all the time. We share them on our intranet. We share them in a newsletter. We, we have a, um, each of the business units presidents, they, they send out a quarterly report that always has part of it, a, a recognition of uh, stories of collaboration and how they were successful. So it's very important that you continue to share stories of your own internal successes. So in closing, it's companies that build robust, collaborative environments that really have been shown to have superior financial performance. So it actually matters to the bottom line. They also have improved customer experiences because if you remember at the beginning of the presentation, it really is all about adding customer value. Another thing collaborative organizations have is a more effective way of executing uh, plans and goals. They have greater innovation and they have highly motivated employees because the employees feel like that they have a vested interest in all of the goals and the successes of the company. Now, Okay, now you have any questions? Okay. Hello. Yeah, English. <laughs> uh, I'm Will. I work for Hershey's. Uh, and, uh, first, I want to thank you. This is a great talk on a very important topic. I'm glad to see this as part of the agenda. Um, my question has to do with trust. How do you think? My question has to do with trust. 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 Uh -huh. And how do you think about building trust and collaboration first in departments that may not have a lot of trust to begin with? The supply chain and commercial. 
R&D, sales, you know. Yeah, the, and I'll tell you, the answer to that, and I can only answer these questions based on my experience, and that is, and I don't know if this translates well in Chinese, but it has to be a trial by fire. So literally, you have to create these cross-functional teams. You, you have to put these people on teams. And almost in the beginning, you have to force them to work together. One way, I was at an organization that didn't collaborate very well at first, and I just remembered this, but that was a great question. Because actually, they did try to force us to work together, and it didn't work. So what they did was they actually brought in experts, and we had workshops about teamwork, how to work together, how to build trust. And after we were able to attend these workshops and we all got to talk about it amongst one another, then we did a better job of working together. But that's, that's a very good question. The, also, too, I will say this, because of that question, once your organization decides that you're gonna build this collaborative environment and you're actually on the road, please stay on the road. Because it, it's gonna be rough at first. But but it'll happen. Okay. Rudy. Um, <laughs> no problem. Um, questions about decision making process because that's correct. Okay. Because, um, I mean, cross-functional uh, collaboration often, uh, although the KPIs and the measurements will, be, will need to be set um, in, the, in, the, in the beginning, but sometimes they're not fully um, achieved, especially when you, when you are relying on not only internal, um, your internal teams, but also probably third parties, which is, which is our uh, external team. So how do you, how do you navigate through um, within your internal teams where the KPIs and measurements are not actually 100% um, achieved and how the decision making process towards that. Thank you. And now I'll, I'll call it the $50 million project. So in the beginning of the $50 million project, of course we had a team lead, we had a co-lead, of the team, and then we had the, the team members under there. We actually uh, created KPIs for, um, for the project based on the company goal. I will say we communicated to the company that this $50 million would be realized over a three-year period. But of course, as soon as we started talking about this project, the upper levels, the executives of our company misunderstood the timeline, which then affected what we had published as the KPIs. So it's very important that first you create KPIs, second that you publish them and you make them public, and then third, that you talk about them, and you talk about them often. And whenever there's a misunderstanding about the KPIs, it needs to be discussed. I mean, literally, I had to go to a high-level board meeting and discuss the fact that we were not going to realize that $50 million within a 12-month period. But I was confident in doing that because we had published the KPI, we had, we had been talking about that KPI across the organization, and it's just some people just heard it wrong. So those three things will help you. Did I answer your question? I have one more. I have one more. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I come from ABF, uh, AB Impact, the biggest beer company, uh, and the mixed tail, which Du uh, Wen Zheng, sir, yeah, Du Wen Zheng, yeah, uh, sharing the product from our company. So welcome to try that. And it's already launched and very good product. 
Okay, back to the question here. Uh, it's said that I'm uh, working in the TV technology and the development uh, department. And uh, it's said that we are based in supply chain, but we will also like the multi-function uh, connected department. And uh, from the year to year, we have more and more innovation products. So the challenge is bigger, and we also feel more complete when we do in the innovation, uh, more projects year by year. And we also have the implementation manager in our department to manage the projects. And then in this case, in fact, I'm the, my role is like the uh, patent material development. So I'm more focused on the material development, this role. But at the same time, I will also take the challenge of the project delivery, uh, launch date. And then in this case, the project implementation manager, they will also share the same KPI. Uh, in fact that we feel more and more conflict between the new role, uh, role, I mean the job of the implementation manager and the uh, and the my role because my role most of the time is to develop uh, is to help my team member to increase their capability and to support the project could be delivered on time. And then uh, I, I don't know what's the uh, good structure for this uh, kind of cross function uh, department because more and more projects will have more and more conflict between the role of the project manager and the line manager of the project team member. So I, I want I want to know that whether there is some good suggestion or recommendation or some mindset to uh, like the no matter if project manager or the line manager to have a better and clear role responsibility or some toolkit can can help us. That's the that's the case and so thanks for that. Okay. Let me mirror back what I think I heard you say. That you and another person are buried in projects. You're not sure, especially if it, when it comes to KPI, what is most important and who should be responsible for what. Is that your question? Uh, like that, and uh, we also have a conflict between the line manager and the project manager because I think the, the cross function will always have this kind of conflict. Okay, yeah. and, and actually, I'm, I'm kind of glad you said that. And, and don't be mad at me when I say there shouldn't ever be that kind of conflict. And the reason there should never be that kind of conflict between the line manager and the other manager because there should be clearly de defined roles as you're working on these projects. So, so um, the, the RACI, are you, are you familiar with a RACI chart? Responsible, accountable? Yeah, there, there should be a, a RACI of who is responsible, who is accountable, who's informed every, for every project. And then that actually eliminates that conflict between those two people. It should be actually clearly defined because it really matters when it comes to whether you meet the KPIs or not. There, there has to be a leader. I answered your questions. Melody, I've been waiting for you, but I'm sorry I missed your ball fish. And uh, I'm now working with two designers who are working on an internet project. Uh, but now the thing is, uh, I've never worked with the designers, and uh, this kind of thing is kind of, uh, you know. So I want to know, during your experience, is there some case like a uh, designer is really good, but he's really got, uh, you know, really got uh, some characters? So you cannot force him to do something, right? Never. And uh, but you have to set set deadline, right? Is it good to set such kind of deadline, or is there another way to make them, you know, work? 
not 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 really creating, you know. <laughs> you don't want to create conflict. Conflict is good actually if it's managed well. So you're working with designers that are not meeting your deadlines, and you're you're wanting to know how to make them meet the deadlines. <laughs> I mean, is it good to set a deadline? I mean, yes. I never should. Absolutely. 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 So, yeah. the, you can force him. You cannot force him. Yes, you, you can. And Lord, I, I have worked with designers for 28 years. No, you cannot force them to meet the deadline. But if you have a defined plan with deadlines and what I call stage gates, where you're checking in, then if the designer person or firm misses the deadline, then that's something you can hold them accountable for. But if there's no stated deadline, there's nothing you can hold them accountable for. So, and I always say this, and I don't know if it translates, it's like the tail wagging the dog, because you're, you yeah, know, the tail was wagging the dog instead of the dog wagging its tail. Because the designers are working for your brand, is that correct? Yeah. yeah, they work for you, is that correct? Well, they but but they you you are their customer. So so yes, you should have a very well defined schedule of timing, and when they don't meet the deadline, you should discuss it and hold them accountable. Maybe you don't pay them. If they miss the deadlines, oh, does that make you uncomfortable? No, no, no. I, the idea pay, pay is a kind of better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, okay, because you know the idea of, of them not getting paid unless they meet the deadlines, that wouldn't make me uncomfortable because them missing the deadline is causing me stress. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for sharing, Cindy. <laughs> 大家想知道我们的最后一个提问的嘉宾说的是谁吗？就是为大家设计胸牌的我们的设计水平的我们的设计师，他叫曹可风，英文我们都叫他 KFC， 忘了他的那个拼音名字。谢谢曼娜姐